Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Fifth Estate at the Wheeler Centre. I'm Sally Warhaft, and uh, it's a real pleasure tonight uh, to be able to talk to these three gentlemen uh, about, well, some changing relationships in our region and a little further afield uh, with India and Indonesian elections. Of course, the Indian one has just recently been resolved. The Indonesian election is coming in a matter of weeks. Um, and Australia, of course, has a still relatively new government, even if you feel like it's been half a lifetime <laughs> already. Uh, and uh, we thought that um, it was a good opportunity to just have another look. Um, we have on the Fifth Estate over the past three years, of course, looked at many countries individually, including Indonesia and India, but it seemed like a good time to come back to these two um, together around um, the, the elections. So we're very, very fortunate to have Tim Lindsay, who is just our second uh, repeat guest at the Fifth Estate, a very high order, which he shares with Greg Sheridan, which he's mulling over. Uh, and uh, Tim... <laughs> is a professor of Asian law and uh, the director of the Asian Law Centre at Melbourne University. He's also the foundation director for Islamic Law and Society at Melbourne, the chair of DFATS Australia Indonesia. Um, he's the author of many books, essays and articles, uh, and this year will publish Islam, Law and the State in Southeast Asia and the Indonesian Constitution. Are these actually- Last year, actually. That was last mm. year. Better update your profile. <laughs> uh, you'd need to update it every day. Uh, he is incredibly sought after consultant um, in Indonesia and Australia by uh, both government agencies and aid groups. And uh, he maintains his practice as a barrister uh, in his spare time. Please uh, welcome Tim Lindsay. Thank you. Hamish MacDonald is a foreign correspondent. Uh, I've got him in the middle because he straddles both Indonesia and India and elsewhere. He's um, worked in Jakarta, Tokyo, New Delhi and Beijing. He was the Asia-Pacific editor for the Sydney Morning Herald. He picked up two Walkley Awards. He is the author of one of the classic texts on Indonesia, Suharto's Indonesia, which was published in 1980. And his latest book is Demokrasi. Not quite right, was it, uh, my pronunciation? But um, uh, this book in my hand, which will surely become another classic, and you can purchase the book at the end of tonight's session. He's based at the ANU and is world editor for the Saturday paper. Please welcome Hamish. <laughs> and Pradeep Taneja is the um, fellow of the Australian India Institute at Melbourne University where he also teaches in Asian politics, political economy and international relations in the School of Social Sciences and Political Sciences. And his particular interest is uh, China-India relations and uh, the rise of China and India and government business relations in Asia. And uh, like our other two guests, he is also very widely published uh, both here and abroad. So welcome Pradeep and, and thank you. <laughs> And uh, look, Pradeep, um, I'll, we'll start um, with, with you because the Indian uh, elections, we've just had the elections over there, and it was an absolute routing for the Congress party. I know it caught me uh, by surprise. There's a new Prime Minister, the BJP, uh, the sort of more right-wing party has come to office. Were you surprised? Tell us, tell us first of all, your just broad thoughts on, on this result for India. Well, thank you, sir. I wasn't surprised about Modi's win. I think most people expected the BJP to win. Uh, particularly during the campaign, it became very clear that the BJP will win. But I was surprised by the scale of the win. And particularly 
the, the, the performance of the Congress party in this, because Congress didn't even manage to get 10% of the seats. So officially they are not even uh, the opposition because uh, they need to have at least 10% of the seats in the parliament to be called officially opposition and to have the status of the leader of the opposition for the leader of the Congress party. So I was surprised by the magnitude of the win. And in fact, many people who had joined the BJP over the last year or so, which is about 30% of the people elected to the BJP are new members. Uh, either they have come from other parties or they were independent and therefore they've joined the BJP. And uh, even they were not expecting that they will get you know, such a large mandate. And people who joined the BJP because they felt that for the country this was the best thing at the moment, particularly for economic reasons that perhaps the BJP would be able to revive the Indian economy. Some of them actually didn't want the BJP to get a clear majority because they felt that if the BJP forms the government but is dependent on other political parties, uh, both within the, the National Democratic Alliance, their alliance, but also from outside the alliance, then this may actually keep the BJP more moderate. Well, it's very rare in India, isn't it, to have a majority, uh, I think 1984 was yeah. the last yeah. time. It's been 30 years. Yeah. Since and a, that was after the assassination of Indira Gandhi, exactly. wasn't it? So it's exactly. a very different. And what do you think? Um, what do you think was going on that there could be such a rejection of the Congress Party, which is a, um, a dynasty in, in India? Yeah. I think it's more. Um, if you look at the the economic performance of the Congress Party, the Manmohan Singh government. In fact, the Manmohan Singh government. Overall, if you average their economic performance, it wasn't too bad. I mean, for the first seven years, they delivered, on average, 8% GDP growth rate. But the fact that growth rate fell in the last three years was perhaps the biggest reason why they lost the election, because people got used to high-speed economic growth, you know, 7 8% growth, in some years even higher. And they, in the last three years, they felt that the government had simply dropped the ball. The government was not in touch with people's aspirations, people's wishes. And uh, that Manmohan Singh was, uh, even though he was a very honest politician, he was a very you know, capable economist, but he simply didn't have the freedom. I mean, that was the general feeling, that he was simply a, you know, acting on behalf of whatever Sonia Gandhi told him to do so. In fact, there was a joke after the election that after the election results were announced that uh, Mrs. Manmohan Singh went to Sonia Gandhi's residence to collect the remote control. <laughs> 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 so, so there was this you know, uh, feeling that uh, the government was out of touch and was not going to be able to revive you know, the, the growth trajectory that India was on before three years ago. Mamahan Singh, of course, didn't run for election this time, as SBY can't um, in uh, the coming weeks. Tim, uh, what Pradeep is you know, sort of talking about, the sentiment within India, are there similarities there in Indonesia, do you think, with the, the, that we tend to look at SBY and Indonesia from Australia in a really different way that, to what Indonesians mm -hmm. Are looking at. Tell us what you think might happen uh, in Indonesia in, in coming weeks with their election. We, we've got a very significant election coming up in Indonesia because uh, President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono has been in power for two terms, 10 years. The constitution says he can't run again. So this is a significant changing of the guard after a decade of the most friendly president for Australia ever. Um, it's also changing the guard in, in another sense almost all the leading political figures in Indonesia now were political leaders under Suharto, that is, before 1998. Megawati, for example, the president opposition leader under Suharto, the, one of the two um, candidates for election, Prabowo Subianto, former son-in-law and general under Suharto. And so it goes. Uh, this is the first election where we will see a fresh face, a person who is not a political leader of any significance at all under Suharto, and that's the, the front runner in the presidential election, which is taking place on 9 July. Um, Joko Widodo, known as Jokowi. Unlike the other figures, he is not um, 
a long-term member of the political elite. He's um, a businessman from a self-made furniture business operator from the central Javanese town of Solo. He grew up in very poor circumstances, living on a riverbank, his family thrown out of their um, rented uh, very small um, huts early on, and he worked his way up to become not just a successful business figure, but to become mayor of this town in Solo, where he transformed Solo during his period as uh, in charge of that city from a very neglected backward town into a place that's seen as somewhat as a model for, for good governance and administrative reform. And there's still a lot of shortcomings, but it's impressive. And he then parlayed that into election as uh, uh, to become governor of Jakarta. Now, Jakarta is uh, one of the world's great megapolises. It's also a deeply dysfunctional city, uh, and it's usually a poison chalice for anyone in the position that he's held. And yet his popularity has not diminished. He has managed to use that role to become the front runner in the elections coming up. Um, in fact, he's regarded as having delivered pretty good governance outcomes in the circumstances, as being transparent, um, and as being concerned, and this is really the key to his success, being concerned with the ordinary person. Uh, and you can see that in his campaign techniques. He has uh, what he calls blusukan, which means these sort of drop-in visits where he appears um, at roadside stalls or in workplaces and sits down and chats with the locals. So it's this rep the fact that he's a new face, he has a reputation for good governance, for anti-corruption credentials and for caring about the poor and uh, the downtrodden in Indonesia puts him at the moment around about 54% on some of the few reliable polls. It's fair to say that polling in Indonesia is um, not yet mature. But uh, uh, if we ignore the ones that are clearly dodgy and uh, corrupt, the, the reliable polls seem to suggest he's been sitting around 50 to 54 per cent. And it is a two-person contest. It is. Uh, the other candidate is uh, very different to, to um, Jokowi. Indonesia really faces a stark choice. As I said before, this is the first time there's been a new face. Uh, it's a critical moment after 10 years of this fairly competent, although somewhat disappointing, Yudhoyono administration. But it is a stark choice between Jokowi and, on the other hand, Proboa Subianto. That's a, definitely an old face. Proboa Subianto was, is a former son-in-law of Suharto, a cashiered former general who was thrown out of the military uh, under Wiranto's command by a ethics committee that included the current president, Yuri Yono. And he was thrown out, of course, for his involvement in abducting and torturing students, which he has admitted, uh, in 1998, around the time the regime fell. But in addition to that, there's massive evidence of his involvement in some human rights atrocities in East Timor, uh, including killing of civilians in large numbers by troops under his command. He's been refused uh, visas for entry into the United States, the United Kingdom, on human rights grounds. Um, as so, was Modi, of yes, course, uh, 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 yes, but as uh, governor of Gujarat. The allegations yeah. against Modi involved... Uh, how he behaved in the context of religious mm. rights. It's a little bit different to actually being a commander in the mm. field when your troops were certainly involved in the massacres of civilians uh, and indeed admitting yourself that you abducted and tortured students. He denies having killed some who have never been seen, but he certainly has admitted to having been involved in the torture of some students. Now, what's remarkable about this is that he comes from, an, unlike Jokowi again, you really couldn't get two more dramatically different individuals. He comes from an elite family, uh, with um, members of his family who are ministers, governors in the Reserve Bank, and interestingly uh, led rebellions against governments in the past. Um, very wealthy, and his brother, a tycoon, who has bankrolled his campaign. And his campaign has been a canny one. It's been advised by Republican spin doctors in, imported from the United States. And they, what they've done is reinvent Prabowo, who has this dark checkered record as a clean skin. And the reason he's been able to do that is that in this election, more Indonesians will be voting for the first time than ever before in an Indonesian election, around about 30% at least, it's hard to say, but around about that number are voting for the first time. And that means they were, either, they were very young. They were children around the time that Suharto fell and Prabowo was bussing gangsters around Jakarta to burn down parts of the town and trying to launch a coup against Suharto's successor, Habibi. They don't remember any of this. 
Uh, and so this full-on massive campaign, and he's everywhere. At one point, they were even stamping his name on banknotes at one point. So this saturation campaign with a huge mass of funding behind it has reinvented him with an electorate who really are not aware of what he did in the past. So he's a, a contender. He's sitting on around 40%. Um, I think he's going to lose. And I think the reason is that if you look at elections since Suharto in Indonesia, Indonesians consistently vote for the figure they believe will deliver clean government, competent administration, and is interested in the little people. Uh, that is being consistent. They've been wrong. A lot of times they're wrong, but that's who they go for. The question is whether Prabowo has convinced enough of them that that's him. Jokowi clearly is that. So I don't think you quite get across the line in time. It's two very <clears throat> different futures, isn't it? Uh, oh, yeah, I on, think so. On, uh, and interesting, too, that, that uh, sort of first-time voters and not having the memory of of, of uh, older age, which was also a big factor with a lot of young Indians just not giving a damn about the Gandhis and uh, mm. the sort of Congress uh, dynastic sort of story. Hamish, how clean is the politics and um, the process of an election in Indonesia? In Indonesia? Mm. Um, I think it's pretty clean. Um, it's you know, sprawling, but it happens in one day, unlike Indonesia, uh, India, where it's staged over uh, several weeks. Um, but I think I haven't heard much uh, dispute in recent times about the counting or conduct of the ballot. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot of electoral bribery of, of voters um, giving away... Um, envelopes and little gifts and so on, which is common in India as well. So uh, there's that weight of money argument um, that suggests that money can influence the voting patterns, especially where um, local bosses can deliver power blocks of um, one affiliation or another, and it's quite common in India to have people delivering vote banks and virtually um, signing up for fellow cast members and so on. But uh, Indonesia, no, I, I think most people accept that the result, whatever it is, will be, um, will be uh, a fair one. Um, there may be some constitutional disputes. I mean, the whole... Um, nature of the presidential election has changed so much. It used to be an indirect election uh, in Suharto's time and then in the first, um, first election afterwards. Then it went to a direct election for the president. Um, and um, next time it's going to be... Um, you won't even have to have parties nominating you. You won't have to have the 20% of the parliament or whatever to put you up. So it's an evolving thing and there were already constitutional challenges to the system in this election which um, was set aside um, and, um, but will come up. There, there might be grounds if Prabowo might do that. The, the real risk with Prabowo would be whether he resorts to some desperate spoiling uh, moves such as happened in 1998, sparking conflict or, or um, you know, um, or worse. Um, so far, it's it's he's been quite restrained, but he is a notoriously hot-tempered person, and with a whole thousands of ex-comrades from the special forces who have uh, not shown that they're greatly reformed from the Suharto era. But the good, the good thing about the um, disputes that will certainly take place, and, and this is what really differentiates the current system from the Suharto system, is there are now mechanisms by which they can be resolved. Not always perfect, but they're there and they function. And in particular, co the Constitutional Court has got its own problems, but it acts as a court of disputed returns, and in the last few elections there have been a large number of those, as you'd expect in a democratic system. We seem to have had a little bit of experience of that ourselves. Um, and it's generally um, worked as an effective pressure valve for those. There's been allegations of corruption, including in the Constitutional Court, and some of them are correct. 
But even despite those problems, which involve the Chief Justice, who's now been removed, uh, even despite those problems, you have a system where disputes are dealt with and the outcomes of the elections have really been broadly, popularly accepted, mainly, I think, because you can dispute them. Hamish mm. referred to vote bank politics, and this is, of course, common in India. Uh, in India, of course, this time it didn't work as well as it used to work in the past because uh, main vote banks were you know, based on caste and, and religion. Yeah. Mm. For example, the Congress Party in India, which has ruled India for much of India's independent history, uh, used to treat the Muslim population of India as its vote bank, and they would have policies which would be intended to buy votes of Muslims. And, and this time, Congress tried very hard to portray the BJP and Modi as you know, communal forces, and, and uh, clearly the, the track record of the BJP, and particularly Modi in Gujarat, wasn't very good. But still, this time, it is believed that about a, about a fifth of the Muslims, in fact, voted for the BJP. And, and many who traditionally have voted for the BJP, many Muslims who traditionally voted for the Congress, this time did not vote for the Congress and voted for other minor parties. But I'm just wondering, what are the vote banks in Indonesia? In India, as I said, it's based on religion and caste. Uh, I, I think it would be probably um, followers of local tycoons, circles of influence, mm -hmm. patronage and so on, who might get um, some um, dispersal of benefits. Um, the the problem they're getting is an interesting one. Yeah. There's still people trying to buy boats and they uh, give gifts, um, food packages, money, clothing, but that doesn't mean the people who receive them mm. are bound by a contract. Mm. Mm. And uh, you've, there have been some candidates complaining, but I bought that village and they didn't vote for me. Yeah. So the, the old system that used to prevail under the Suharto system whereby mm. As Hamish quite rightly says, local figures would guarantee that they, they could deliver votes has come unstuck because the population has got the audacity to exercise their right to vote uh, secretly. Mm. So it's, it's, it's not like the Indian system mm. in that sense. It's become the Indian, the, sorry, the Indonesian, this is going to get complicated, isn't it? <laughs> the Indonesian electorate uh, has consistently shown itself to be independent and fairly discerning. Its problem is it is desperate to find new clean people who can offer good administration and when it thinks it's found them, it goes for them and it's often been wrong. Yudo Yono <laughs> was their darling uh, and he, would, he ended up being a, a disappointment. His party, which was thought to be a clean party, is disintegrated in this sort of feeding frenzy of appalling corruption scandals where all the senior fi almost all the senior figures and the popular faces of his party are in jail or facing trial. Pek AS, the Islamist party, also seen as guaranteeing corruption by reason of religious piety, was also revealed to be as corrupt and as bad as the others. And so it has also slumped. But they're looking for these figures. And we're going through this gradual transformation as the old um, vote banks and power structures are beginning not to deliver. Abu Riz al-Bakri, the tycoon who owns Golkar, the former party of Suharto, is not a candidate in this election and he's been pushing hard to be a candidate for the last decade. He's not there because his machine, he's so unpopular, so disliked, his machine cannot deliver the vote banks that would even make him a candidate because no one, everyone knows he wouldn't win. So it's changing. One more question before we move on to Australia, uh, what you know, these relationship changes might mean for Australia. It, I'm very taken, by the way, about this idea of stamping a face on the money. I'm just wondering <laughs> if next time around we're going to be getting $10 notes with Joe Hockey and <laughs> it's, it's kind of cool because you can't chuck them away, you know, you've got to, they're still worth something. You could refuse to take them. <laughs> um, my sense with Indonesia is is that it's it's that its democracy um, is strengthening slowly. That it's still there's still a fragility to Indonesian democracy that is not the case uh, with with India. I'm wondering if if that you know if that's a, a, a true sense and and how strong. Um, Indonesian democracy actually is because I think Australians expect a lot 
uh, from this idea of democratic Indonesia? I, I think it's a, a flower that's sprung up quickly. Uh, it's still rather weak and could get blown over. Um, there's um, possibly a reaction in train against the devolution of power to the provinces, which I think has been a great strength of Indonesian reform and democracy, the, the um, uh, dispersal of power to the provinces, 30 provinces and about 500 um, third tier governments. Um, if Prabowo came in, there would be possibly an attempt to pull it back, a rather Vladimir Putin-like um, um, concentration of reconcentration of power in the centre. Uh, with Jokowi, I think his instinct, he came from local government himself, he's a product of, of devolution. Uh, his personal instincts would be to encourage um, low-level, small-scale, medium enterprise and local. On the other hand, his party um, is a very nationalist, centralist one, and if Megawati is still calling the shots, she's already on record as saying she thought uh, decentralisation in 1999 was a mistake. Um, she, uh, in, as president herself, she launched quite punitive actions in Aceh, um, a couple of nasty assassinations of a Papuan leader and a human rights leader in, in, uh, in, from Jakarta. Um, if, if Jokowi can shake her off, if he can hijack her party, then I think it will be good and he will be someone who breathes a wave of fresh air through Indonesia or reinvigorates Indonesia because I think the SBY era has tailed off in a very lacklustre way in the last three or four years. Um, with Prabowo, it's going to be a roller coaster ride, I think, mm -hmm. and very difficult for outside countries to deal with him. I mean, he could not come here without massive protest and possibly even uh, attempts to launch a prosecution against him over that student abduction case because he's not faced a formal court martial from that and we might be obliged under the Convention Against Torture to prosecute. Um, you know, I've had military people in Australia point that out to me. They don't. They are terrified of the of that uh, possibility. But um, let's hope the polls are right and Jokowi is is going to win. Absolutely. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> on, on the question of democracy in Indonesia, um, democracy was delivered, obviously. Uh, in response to popular pressure for regime change, but it was in a formal sense done through the amendment of the constitution of 1999 to 2002 uh, through a whole series of really hot debates on the floor of the national legislature. And that's really the guarantor of the democratic system. Now, Prabowo has specifically stated on a couple of occasions that he would like to repeal those amendments. So that is a clear indication uh, that he's not happy with the form that democratisation has taken. So, yeah, I agree that there would be a significant threat. However, I do think that if he tried to do that, he would be confronting 250 million people who really quite like voting. Uh, if, if voting was an Olympic sport, Indonesia would be a contender for the gold medal. Politics is, is a hobby in Indonesia and they enjoy voting. They'd have to because whilst uh, India has the, the, the largest number of voters in an election. On the election day in Indonesia for the legislature, they vote from village to district to provincial to national. They actually win the largest number of electoral decisions on a single day. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry about I that. I think in right. India would so, be giving them a run for their money on... Uh, yeah, and they do it one day, not, mm. not a week. But uh, yeah. In India, although at every parliamentary election, there are some states that are going to the polls too. So this time, for mm. example, there were a few states mm. that went to the polls at the same time. We'd better get our calculators out of the yeah. back and see who wins. <laughs> but but uh, the Indonesians would, I th they, they, mm. a, a leader who tried to do that would face uh, upheaval and massive civil strife because Indonesians, yeah. particularly at the local level, completely agree with Hamish, would not accept it if that was yeah. tried. Um, the real threat to democracy, I think, lies in the fundamental organ of democracy, which is the legislature. 
the DPR in Indonesia, because this is undoubtedly one of the most corrupt organisations in Indonesia for a whole lot of reasons. Um, and one of them is a lack of party discipline and so forth, so that almost every vote is a conscience vote, and that creates vote buying in the legislature. That's the really big issue. And it has, the legislature has very low standing in Indonesia. We're familiar with this, of course, maybe not the bribes. Well, actually, yes, also the bribes issue. But uh, the DPR, frankly, stinks in Indonesia. And uh, that really does need to be reformed. It needs to perform better as the most powerful constitutional body in Indonesia, which it is, not the presidency. That the power leaked from the president to the legislature after Suharto, and it is not performing, it is corrupt. If that isn't fixed, then I think that really does create a real threat to the future of democracy. Uh, Pradeep, our dear leader has just returned from a whirlwind overseas tour, and he has continued the tradition, I think, of both sides of Australian politics of a sort of benign neglect of India by not stopping in. Uh, I, uh, I, of course, wasn't mm. surprised by that, and I'm, I'm sure you weren't either. But um, tell us what uh, the relationship uh, between, uh, well, Tony Abbott and, and Narendra Modi, I don't think, know each other, um, but uh, what, how this might play out uh, in a relationship that, on a government level, has always been underachieving uh, mm. for sometimes tricky reasons to, to get to the heart of. But could this sort of clean slate of a, a, a new prime minister, new party, majority in his own right, uh, with the Abbott government, what are the... Well, I, I don't think there's going to be any natural chemistry between Abbott and Modi. Uh, they're two very different you know, individuals. They're both, both monks or ex <laughs> They're both God-fearing, <laughs> I think. <laughs> uh, but, but there is something in common in the sense that Abbott said, you know, open for business. I mean, he's been saying that in Wall Street. He was saying that during the election campaign. And Modi is also very pro-business. I mean, he sees himself as pro-business, and he's been advising everyone, including the, the latest batch of Indian diplomats to graduate from the Foreign Services Institute. He's been saying that they should be promoting brand India. And so he's very big on, on, on promoting Indian business. And that may be something in common between Abbott and Modi. But I think my, my reading of Australia's relations with Asia is that, and perhaps Indonesia is one exception to the rule, is that until there is substantive business relationship between Australia and Asian countries, Australia doesn't really take those countries too seriously. I mean, the relationship is not built to that level where it can be sustained unless it's being backed by large volumes of trade, uh, particularly exports of Australian commodities. At the moment, uh, Australia and India are competitors when it comes to iron ore exports. I mean, both India, I mean, India's iron ore exports have almost stopped uh, recently because of you know, corruption and other scandals. But until recently, India and Australia were actually competing in the iron ore market. But if Modi is able to kickstart the Indian economy, if India can return to 8 9% growth, then it is possible that you know, India could actually become a net importer of iron ore from Australia. I mean, Indian companies are already very keen to invest in Australia, and we've seen a company, a company from Gujarat, the Adani Group, says they're investing $10 billion in Australia. So I think even if uh, Abbott goes to India before November, before Modi comes to Brisbane for the, for the G20 meeting, I don't think that's going to really set the stage for a sustainable, strong relationship. I mean, benign neglect has been really the hallmark of this relationship. And I don't think it's going to change until India becomes a major trading partner. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, every Australian government comes to power berating its predecessor <laughs> for ignoring India and uh, saying it's going to be different this time. And uh, I. Abbott has already invited Modi to come to Australia uh, and says it's going to be a priority as, you know, we've had foreign ministers from Western Australia the last couple of times, so um, they look to India too. Um, but uh, 
you know, it's the degree of complementarity and also the um, barriers to some kinds of investment that, that um, are thrown up in, on the Indian side. Um, and I'm not sure they'll be quickly removed. After, I mean, Modi is a Hindu nationalist and the nationalist part of that outfit is very protective of Indian business and Indian um, trading communities and so on. Um, but that said, there are obvious things that Australia could do much more of, particularly in education and, um, partic and trade skills, uh, in e even as much as academic skills. So um, I, I think there's prospects for quite, quite a lot of growth there. The other thing Abbott and um, Modi have in common is a wish to sort of take it up to China on the yeah. strategic front. And they, they would be like-minded there, uh, I think, in that strategic outlook. Tim, uh, Tony Abbott, uh, his stop in Jakarta, oh, it wasn't Jakarta, actually, he met, uh, where was it that he met mm -hmm. the president? It was uh, outside of Batam. Jakarta. Yep. Um, yeah, was incredibly important, obviously, after that uh, getting off to a, a rocky uh, <laughs> start. How did it go? First of all, uh, look, the relationship has gone from crisis to band aid. Um, we're not back where we were before the uh, wiretapping, the phone tapping scandal when President Yudhoyono and his wife and inner circle's phones were tapped. We're not back to there. We are, however, out of the crisis mode. We still have military intelligence and people smuggling cooperation formally suspended. We still have a relationship that's formally downgraded diplomatically. Uh, at least they're talking to each other now, so we have a peak level interaction. In the meantime, the governments have been talking together about this roadmap this, for this code of conduct that is to be agreed and signed off on by the Indonesian president. When that happens, the relationship can normalise, cooperation can begin again. Um, that's not an easy thing to do. A protocol for military and intelligence and people smuggling cooperation is incredibly difficult. Um, they're talking about getting it sorted by August. We'll see if that happens. The that was an Indonesian initiative, wasn't it? Is that it right? Well, that was no. That was the, yes, it, it was. That was a condition imposed yeah. by Jakarta to normalise relations, and Australia agreed to that and signed off on it. Um, the, the concern is to get that finalised before President Yudhoyono leaves office so that there is a, a platform then for the relationship to go ahead because it will be highly problematic if Raboa comes in. He's aggressively nationalist and uh, strongly running on policies of economic autarky and protectionism. Jokowi is a, a sort of more neutral. He, he is successful because he's focused on internal domestic policies and governance. He's not been outwardly focused and he doesn't really have any particular foreign policy positions at all. That's not to mean he'll be bad, it's just that he's not interested at the moment. Um, he'll probably, he's a good administrator, he'll probably be effective in that role in due course. But obviously it'll be very difficult, whoever wins, even more difficult for us if we haven't sorted this issue before the election. And Yudha Yono has always been pro-Australia, there is a goodwill there, they need to do it pretty quickly. But I don't think we should underestimate the difficulty of that and even when that's in place, the relationship will still be subject to tension. If I could just drag this out mm, for a bit please, longer, yeah. for, th for three reasons. The first mm. is that uh, Indonesia matters to Australia far, far more than Australia matters to Indonesia. There's, whatever the tensions between the two parties, it's basically a bipartisan position that Indonesia is one of Australia's, if not its most important international relationship and the other relationships depend to an extent on that. That was Keating Doctrine. It ended up, incredibly enough, being Howard Doctrine and just standard in government now. But it's not the popular view in Australia at all. And in fact, over that same period of time, Australian attitudes towards Indonesia have got far, far worse. So we have this huge gap between the strategic and economic importance of engagement with Indonesia, principally strategic actually, and then the popular view which is misinformed and actually quite very hostile. And it is hostile. And the polling shows that it's actually got more hostile, not less. So there'll always be a problem for governments in managing it. Um, the second reason is, or the third reason, um, 
the first one is that they're not paying attention to us, we don't matter to Jakarta. The second is that government and the public have different views, so the relationship's always vulnerable. And the third thing is the boats. Because whatever we do at the top level between Australia and Indonesia, as soon as there is an asylum seeker problem, the fact that we're running a unilateral policy in Indonesia has for years demanded a bilateral at least, and preferably a multilateral arrangement on the boats means that when our boats wander into their waters, when an orange lifeboat turns up, when there's a pushback, whatever it is, then the relationship immediately will flare up again. So there's a basic flaw in it. Now, there haven't been some, any incidents like that for a little while, but let's just say everything goes well with the, the um, protocol for cooperation and it's signed off on, and then we have a boat crisis and bang, the relationship goes up in flames again. So we have some inherent instabilities that really do need to be resolved in the longer term for the relationship to stabilise. And at the same time, I suppose uh, people here trying to prepare for either or candidate winning this election, which would have a very different outcome, presumably, for Australia and Indonesia. It will, but the best thing in either, in either situation is to sort out the current... Let, let me just repeat it. There is no cooperation in military intelligence and people smuggling, and we are officially downgraded. Mm. Now, they are serious things mm. between neighbouring countries. Get them fixed at least, and then deal with what will undoubtedly be a challenging period. Mm. Um, you, you mentioned the sort of feelings uh, here about uh, Indonesia. The uh, Lowy Institute released its poll last week, I think, or the week before, and it, I know it is another poll, but it's an interesting one because they return to similar questions or, or, uh, over the years. So it's actually a poll where you do get an interesting pattern of Australian views about other countries and, and uh, issues. And um, they have a feelings thermometer that they've done for years, just about Australian feelings towards other countries. And... Um, Indonesia is, it's just warm, it's 52 degrees. Um, and just to give you an idea of the spectrum, New Zealand's the warmest at 84%. North Korea is at the bottom with a surprisingly, in fact, disturbingly high 29%, <laughs> which I, I really wanted to ask a question when I went to the event about that, but uh, there you go. Uh, but it's a, it's a warm, uh, uh, 52 degrees. India's a bit warmer, 57. Uh, and, uh, um, but uh, probably a more important uh, question, and, and one again that's been asked over years, was about relations with Indonesia. Only 7% of Australians felt that it was improving. 50% uh, thought it was staying the same, and 40% uh, felt that it was deteriorating so uh, you know a friendly but but deteriorating well, I think feel. that's quite realistic I mean the poll was taken in February when yep. things were going pear-shaped over the Edward Snowden revelations and the boat people turn backs and you know fresh from thinking of buying up fishing boats in Indonesian villages <laughs> and stationing Australian spies in every coastal village you know I'm surprised it wasn't much worse. We I'm haven't covered really, ourselves in glory, is, have we? <laughs> whether this is Fahrenheit or centigrade. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. um, 50 per cent isn't too bad. 50 yeah. degrees yeah. isn't yeah, too we, bad. We have to remember that they've, they've been like, like that for a long, long time. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, there was one point a few years ago when Indonesia was only rated... The only countries below Indonesia were, again, North Korea, Iran, Iraq and, um, for some reason, Saudi Arabia were the only ones worse. So, uh, you know, the, I, I agree it could well have been worse at the time the poll was taken, but it's been bad for 10 years. And you have to go back, actually, and this is really an indictment of Australian popular attitudes. You go back to the Suharto era, when Australians were much more positive about Indonesia. How does that work? So, so what's happened is Indonesia opened up, democratised, got rid of it, pushed the army back, got rid of its dictator, uh, ran elections, and we, dis we dislike it. Yeah. It's become, well, I think partly because it's been perceived as a much less safe place. You know, uh, the whole Yudhoyono period has coincided with the post-Bali bombing yeah. episode of the attack on the Australian Embassy, all the travel warnings from our Foreign Affairs Department haven't been able to run many student exchanges as a result of that. 
Um, you've had Chappelle Corby and the Bali Nine and all of these cases, um, you know, teenage um, schoolies getting into trouble in Kuta and all, all this kind of bad vibe stories, plus the tsunami and volcanic mm. eruptions, it comes across as a rather dangerous place. Mm. So I'm not surprised. Mm. And it was much more stable under Sahato and much, you know... You and and we knew a lot less about it. It yeah, was yeah. still pretty dangerous in many respects, particularly for particular groups, but we just didn't know about it. Mm. And the opening up of a country means you can go in... If you dropped Indonesia on the map of Europe, it would run from Moscow to close to Dublin. If you reported that as a single country, it would be non-stop horror stories. And mm. I think part of the problem is the opening up of the country allows the detail to come out. But I, mean, I agree with, with Hamish completely that... Uh, this, there has been this flood of bad news stories, probably as a function of democracy in many ways. Um, and that's what contributes to this tension between negative public attitudes and government uh, commitment to the necessity and importance of the relationship. Mm. And that gap is an ongoing problem. Um, if you have a question, please just mm. put up your hand and somebody will put a microphone in it. Oh, my question is to Pradeep. Um, do you think it's time for a new political party in the Indian federal scene or do you think that um, Congress can resurrect itself with Rahul and Priyanka Gandhi? And the second part of the question, what's the Indian perspective on Australia these days? Okay. Well, there, there are too many political parties in India. According to the Election Commission of India, there are 1,600 political parties in India. <laughs> So there is enough political parties. As for, uh, we did have the brief emergence of a new political party, the Aam Admi Party or the Common Man Party. And in the, the, the last uh, Delhi assembly election, they did quite well. In fact, they formed the government for 49 days. But and then resolved, uh, they've kind they? of fizzled out. They, they, the people have realized that they, they were a single issue party, they were against corruption, but they had no experience of governance and no, no policies on other important things that matter to people, for example. They've the influenced economy. this result, though, somewhat, would you, would you say? In I think they have, they have benefited the BJP. Mm. I mean, Aam Aadmi Party won four seats, and all in Punjab. But uh, and, and none in Delhi, where they had done so well in the assembly elections. But uh, to look at, to come back to the Congress and you know, the future of the Congress Party, I think Congress still has uh, a lot of strength. Congress is, after all, a party which has ruled India for much of India's independent history. It's a over a century old party. They have a lot of grassroots organisation, and if they if they you know try and rebuild their grassroots infrastructure. I think they, they could come back. And, but it also depends on how the BJP government under Narendra Modi does you know, over the next five years. Uh, Modi has raised expectations. In other words, people are now expecting that Modi will deliver you know, good results. And he is now engaged in expectations management. He's trying to say, look, things will happen, but give us time. We're going to have to make some tough decisions. And therefore, you know, something that we're all familiar with here, uh, tough decisions will have to be made. Indian, uh, the finance minister will present the budget to the parliament in July. So there's not a lot of time you know, before the budget. So, and there are going to be some tough decisions. But if Modi is able to deliver on even 35 to 40 percent of the promises, I think he could get another term. Uh, and I mean, I think it's likely that this will be a two-term government. Uh, because they should be able to, uh, to at least uh, uh, kickstart growth in areas where India did see, you know, a rapid growth. So until three years ago, growth was pretty good. So I think if Modi is able to to rebuild some of those institutions, uh, restart some of those economic policies which created that economic growth under the Manmohan Singh government, they should be able to to achieve, you know, 6.5, 7 percent growth. And if the external circumstances change, if the world economy begins to pick up, and if China doesn't slow down, then India could actually even reach 8 and 9 percent growth. I mean, that's a possibility. But Congress Party is, is, is the only national party, or has been the only national party so far. I won't write it off. I think Congress still has, has a you know, future in Indian politics. Hello. Uh, Hamish, I think, mentioned before that India 
might be disposed to, um, I think you said, take it up to China uh, strategically. I'm just wondering what that might entail. Uh, well, we've already seen one symbolic um, aspect of that. Um, when Modi was sworn in, he had the Prime Minister of the exiled Tibetan government uh, as one of his invited guests, much to the annoyance of the Chinese embassy. Um, he has talked of a more uh, robust uh, presence on the disputed borders with, uh, with China, um, although he'll find that the logistics of that are very much weighted towards China and that, um, but, but there will be stepped up pressure there. I think he will uh, in deepen the already strong cooperation with Japan and Vietnam on the military side um, and um, uh, try to encourage a greater in flow of investment from Japan and South Korea into India to, to sort of build up a, a kind of sinews of economic power as well. Um, you might see a bit more Indian naval activity um, in the South China Sea, just, just to show, to irritate the Chinese more than anything else. Um, they've already done a bit of that under Congress and I expect there might be a bit more. Um, I would think this is his party is the one who carried out the nuclear test and made India an overt nuclear power so I would suspect there would be more emphasis on building up the nuclear triad um, and uh, really you know generally uh, talking talking more toughly about towards China on a whole range of things I think I mean this this would be a real test of Modi's diplomatic skills. Modi has uh, never been a member of India's national parliament until he became prime minister, uh, <laughs> but he did visit China four times and he's been to Japan. So his experience of overseas uh, engagement is rather limited, but his, his sort of most significant experience is actually is dealing with China. I mean, he has focused in the past, when he was chief minister of Gujarat, on China very much. And that is more business sort of related. Uh, at the same time, he has developed a, a good relationship with Abe, the Prime Minister of Japan. And, um, and he's going to Japan very soon in the first week of July. He, in fact, wanted to make Japan his first foreign destination. But within the Indian Foreign Service, he was advised that that may be too provocative. So he decided to go to Bhutan. So he spent the last couple of days in Bhutan so Japan doesn't become his first overseas destination. But I think balancing that relationship between Japan and uh, India's relationship with Japan and China is going to be a real test of Modi's you know, diplomatic skills and, and that of his government. I mean, we all know that uh, the relationship between China and Japan is toxic. And for Modi to develop a strategic or a military relationship uh, within the constraints of the Japanese constitution, if Modi is able to develop a much more proactive uh, strategic relationship with Japan, uh, clearly China is not going to be terribly happy about it. But at the same time, Modi is, Modi is very keen to develop a good, productive, commercial relationship with China. And, and China is keen for that to happen too, because China sent its uh, foreign minister to India. I mean, within days of Modi becoming prime minister, the Chinese foreign minister landed in Delhi. And this was not something which was prearranged. It happened only after the elections. So the Chinese are very keen to make sure that India you know, gives China the kind of uh, significance that China you know, seeks. And at the same time, China says that China is willing to invest in Indian infrastructure, invest in high-speed railways, which Modi is very keen on. Uh, so I think it's still early days. I think uh, taking it up to China is not going to be as easy as perhaps some of the more excitable elements within the BJP or the Sangha Parivar, you know, the BJP family of organizations think. I think taking it up to China is going to be difficult until India is able to rebuild its economy to the level, at least half that of China. And then that's going to take some time. Mm. 
Um, I'm just interested in the panel's views on the role of business in advancing the relationship between Indonesia and Australia and whether there is some kind of link between the poor or less positive public opinion about Indonesia and how that might affect Australian businesses' appetite to engage with the region. Yeah, we don't have um, the sort of strong relationship in terms of business that we should have with Indonesia. First, because it's going to become a hugely important uh, economy in the world. I mean, by 2050, it'll be in the top four. I wonder what the other ones will be. Uh, by 2030, it'll be bigger than Germany. Imagine that. Imagine in Southeast Asia, where there's an economy bigger than Germany's in the top number seven by 2030. It will transform Southeast Asia. So it's obviously going to be hugely significant, according to rating agencies at any, any, any rate. Excuse the repetition. Um, but we are not engaged in the way we should be. Indonesia is uh, usually somewhere between our 13th and 16th uh, best trading partner, varies a little bit. But more significantly, uh, investment's very low from Australia and Indonesia. We invest more in New Zealand than we do in Indonesia. It wouldn't surprise you that we invest more in Singapore, perhaps, than Indonesia, uh, but New Zealand is pretty disturbing, I think. Um, so this is a powerhouse economy that's that is at the moment got around about nine million or so people entering the middle class. On, on, according to some rating agencies, the middle class is about 30% of the population and will be about 50% within about 20 years. Um, it's going to, uh, this image we have of Indonesia as this rural country with uh, cities dotted around it, by 2030, 70% of the population will be living in cities. It's the, Jakarta is the single biggest tweeting city in the world. It's one of the biggest Facebook users in the world. Indonesia has got some of the highest smartphone penetration in the world. We need to radically rethink the way we imagine this country. And clearly business isn't doing that. The usual line is, oh, it's, there's problems of corruption, it's dangerous, you don't want to invest there. And my answer is, and that's different to China and India because, I mean, mm -hmm. corruption and uh, um, physical danger are common issues around this emerging area. Uh, Indonesia is not really different to the others, but Australia is missing the boat. Now, to the extent that business becomes a platform for engagement, uh, we are way behind. Uh, and economies in Northern Asia um, and now increasingly in Europe are seeing the advantage of Indonesia as a sort of third player after the giants of China and India and are moving in there, but we're stuck. And one of the reasons for that it goes back to the fact that uh, when Australians look north for investment, they think of the big economies of China and India. And there's this, that the, the anxieties that Hamish describes so well seem to act as a complete block for us, Indonesia is a place for cheap holidays and terrorists. And until we get over that and have a deeper appreciation, business is probably not going to take the risk until it's too late, until it's overwhelmingly obvious and others have got a, a bigger jump on us than they already do now. Warm feelings really matter, don't they? To, yeah. some, to yeah. this extent. I, I think it's got to be said that there are you know, caveats you'd have to give to business. I mean, the, for all the macroeconomic policies that encourage foreign investment. There are powerful ministries um, in charge of various sectors, agriculture, transport, communications, and so on, which are like little fiefdoms who um, try to control everything, promote local heroes, susceptible to influence, um, and have a mentality that uh, complicates things and, in fact, in, in structures that are sometimes designed to extract bribes and stop much happening. So, I, I mean, I think this narrative that Australians are missing out or, you know, is perhaps a little unfair. I mean, they have jumped into the mining sector as much as they can and are quite big players, although. Um, they probably jumped in too early and then jumped out before it really took off in the, the last decade. Uh, it was in other sectors too, that, that yeah. pattern of going in in the 80s yeah. and 90s, getting uh, burnt and yeah. not going back. I think, I think generally it's not just with Indonesia, but with Australian business there is 
um, a, a very short time frame for investments. They tend to want money back within three years or yeah. three to five years. And if you're jumping into a new culturally different place, you know, New Zealand is easy, Indonesia, India, Thailand or wherever, you've got to be there on the ground, study it and not expect much to happen for mm -hmm. quite a long time. And, and, and that is demonstrated by the fact that the Australian businesses that have been successful over there have generally been those that have been there for a long time, we're prepared to take lost leaders and establish effective relationships and you know, dec a decade or two later they start getting the benefits of it. Mm -hmm. the, the problem we've got is we're running out of time to start doing that. Our hour is up. It went so um, fast and uh, so I'm sorry if you had your hand up and didn't get to ask a question. Uh, if you would like to buy Hamish's book, Democracy, uh, it's for sale down um, the back there and I'm sure he'll autograph it uh, for you as well. Uh, it's been a really enlightening conversation and uh, perhaps I think, you know, in, in 12 months' time we should regroup and see how these uh, new governments and relationships are, are panning out. But, gentlemen, thank you so very much for uh, coming tonight and, and uh, enlightening us all uh, on this topic. Please thank our guests. Um,